Okay, let's talk about adrenergic receptors and answer the questions. What are adrenergic receptors and what are the different types, locations, and functions of adrenergic receptors and what are some clinical correlations? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. So what are adrenergic receptors? Well, they are receptors that bind norepinephrine and epinephrine or noradrenaline and adrenaline. And there are two types of adrenergic receptors. Alpha adrenergic receptors with the alpha 1 and alpha 2 subtype. And then there's beta adrenergic receptors with beta 1 and beta 2 subtypes. There is a beta 3, but I will not be talking about it in this tutorial. And so all these, these adrenergic receptors are part of the G protein family. So G protein coupled receptors act through second messengers like alpha 1 adrenergic receptor is linked with the GQ family of proteins and alpha 2 with the GI family of proteins and beta 1 and beta 2 with the GS family of proteins. And I remember them by the KISS abbreviation, which is this except with a Q. Here is a cell membrane of an effector tissue which contains a G protein that you see spanning from the extra to the intracellular component of the membrane with on the, on the outside an adrenergic receptor. So when a first messenger like norepinephrine binds to the adrenergic receptor, it activates a conformational change in this G protein complex which then generates a secondary messenger which triggers a cascade of physiological events inside the cell. This is why some um, G proteins can cause vasoconstriction and others vasodilation of smooth muscle. So when norepinephrine binds to the adrenergic receptors on the outside of a cell, it activates secondary messengers on the inside of a cell. So let's talk about first alpha adrenergic receptors. And to do that, we'll talk about the receptor and the tissues the receptors are found on and the responses when you stimulate those receptors. So let's start with the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor and systemic arterioles causing vasoconstriction. Here is a systemic arterial in cross-section with the tunica media and smooth muscle uh, in the middle layer. That smooth muscle contains alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. So when norepinephrine binds to that receptor, shing, you get vasoconstriction. This results in an increase of blood pressure and total peripheral resistance. Let's look at it again with this circulatory system schematic and we'll focus on the arterial that feeds capillary beds. So the arterioles that have these alpha adrenergic receptors on the smooth muscle. So when the norepinephrine binds, look what happens backstream to it. What happens then is you stimulate the alpha-1 receptors in those, those arterioles. It increases blood pressure and increases total peripheral resistance. Now let's talk about the dilator pupillary muscle. Well, the diameter of the pupil is controlled by two different muscles, the sphincter pupillae muscle and the dilator pupillary muscle, which is also known as the pupillary dilator, iris dilator, or the radial fibers. Well, the alpha-1 receptors on the pupil dilator muscle, when stimulated by norepinephrine, shing, is going to cause pupil dilation, or also known as mydriasis. Now, the internal urethral sphincter, when stimulating alpha-1 receptors, causes contraction. Here is the bladder with the internal urethral sphincter at the neck of the bladder, housing, which houses, uh, has, not houses, which has an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. So when sympathetic neurons release norepinephrine, watch, shing, you get contraction of the internal urethral sphincter. So to fill the bladder, this is a sympathetic action where parasympathetics empty the bladder. And during ejaculation, this was to prevent semen from going back into the bladder. So in benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH, this is, you have an enlarged prostate that compresses the urethra and makes it difficult to pee. Here's the sagittal section of the prostate normally and with BPH. Normal BPH makes it difficult to pee. So a treatment is to give an alpha-1 antagonist which relaxes the internal urethral sphincter, makes it easier to pee. Here is the internal urethral sphincter. There's an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. 
And when we block that receptor, it relaxes the internal urethral sphincter, making it easier to pee. Some side effects are hypotension, because if you recall, alpha-1 adrenergic receptors are on systemic arterioles. So if you block them in the bladder, you will block them in the bloodstream. And so you can dilate the blood vessels, causing someone to get lightheaded. And also retrograde ejaculation, because if that sphincter relaxes and is open uh, during ejaculation, semen can go into the bladder. Now let's talk about alpha-2 adrenergic receptors that are found uh, on the norepinephrine nerve terminal, which are inhibitory in nature. Activation of the alpha-2 receptors decreases the amount of norepinephrine released, which is why alpha-2 agonists are considered anti-adrenergic. Um, alpha-2 receptors are also found in many neurons in the brain, which is why alpha-2 agonists cause sedation. This seems a little confusing, doesn't it? Well, let's go over it in more detail. Here's a pre and post ganglionic sympathetic neuron. We'll take a nerve terminal from this post ganglionic sympathetic neuron here. And there is uh, an effector tissue and the space in between is the synapse, which makes this the presynaptic membrane, which houses the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. On the postsynaptic membrane is what you find an adrenergic receptor normally. So this is what we're going to show that when you stimulate the alpha-2 receptor, you decrease norepinephrine release. So watch, norepinephrine is released into the synapse and it goes and it binds to that adrenergic receptor on that postsynaptic membrane. But watch this one. Shing! It then binds to this alpha-2 receptor on the presynaptic membrane, and it initiates a chemical change that inhibits vesicles from fusing with the plasma membrane, stopping the neuron from releasing norepinephrine. This is why alpha-2 agonists are considered anti-adrenergic. If you stimulate alpha-2 receptors, norepinephrine is not released. I know, I know. Okay, so there are the alpha adrenergic receptors. Now let's talk about beta adrenergic receptors. And we'll start with the beta 1 receptor on, receptors on the heart. Here is the heart, and on the heart we have this SA node, which is the pacemaker. It spontaneously generates an action potential that spreads throughout the atria, and it helps determine the heart rate. Um, then you also have the AV node, which slows the conduction velocity of that action potential between the atria and ventricles. Both the SA node and AV node have beta-1 adrenergic receptors. So in sympathetics, release norepinephrine, binding to the beta receptors, beta-1 receptors on the SA node, you can increase heart rate which increases cardiac output. You basically stimulate the SA node and that spontaneous um, conduction that occurs gets shorter and shorter. Norepinephrine binding to the beta-1 receptors on the AV node increases the conduction velocity of the action potential going from atria to the ventricles. Stimulating SA and AV node increases heart rate, cardiac output, and conduction velocity. There are also beta-1 adrenergic receptors on the heart muscle, the myocardium. So when we stimulate that beta receptors on the myocardium, you increase contractility, which increases stroke volume. Okay, now let's talk about the JG cells in the kidney that secrete renin. Well, here is a section of a, an illustration of the glomerulus, and in green are these juxtaglomerular cells, or JG cells, and their purpose is secreting renin. They have a beta-1 adrenergic receptor. So when sympathetics release norepinephrine stimulating the JG cells, they secrete renin, which retains sodium and water in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts to maintain blood volume for mean arterial pressure. Basically, it's part of the RAS system, renin, um, angiotensin aldosterone system. Now let's talk about beta-2 adrenergic receptors. But first, a little note on norepinephrine and epinephrine with beta-2 receptors. Norepinephrine binds weakly to beta-2 receptors, and so its effects on tissues with beta-2 receptors are minor. Now in contrast, circulating epinephrine in the blood has a greater affinity to the beta-2 receptors, like 100 times more than norepinephrine, and so its effects on tissues with beta-2 receptors 
are major. That's why epinephrine has more beta-2 effects at clinically used doses, and this underlies some of the clinical indications for epinephrine versus norepinephrine. So let's talk about beta-2 receptors on systemic arterioles and when stimulating, causing vasodilation. Here's a systemic arteriole in the tunica media with smooth muscle with a beta-2 adrenergic receptor. When the chromaffin cells from the adrenal medulla secrete epinephrine and it binds to the beta-2 receptors, shing! you're going to get vasodilation. This is especially true in blood vessels in skeletal muscle. So stimulating beta-2 receptors in skeletal muscle is great for reducing total peripheral resistance and also increasing cardiac output to activate skeletal muscle. Now, how do I remember how alpha-1 receptors causes vasoconstriction and beta-2 receptors causes vasodilation? Well, I remember the A, B, C's, and D's, where A goes to C and B goes to D, where alpha receptors cause vasoconstriction via norepinephrine, and beta receptors causes vasodilation via epinephrine. That's kind of cute, isn't it? Now, epinephrine has a higher affinity, as I said, for beta-2 receptors in contrast to alpha receptors. I know, wait for it. However, at high concentrations, Epinephrine does bind to alpha receptors on arterioles, which can then override the vasodilatory effects of the beta-2 receptors and cause or produce vasoconstriction. With epinephrine, concentration matters. All right, let's talk about how the ciliary body then stimulating causes an increase of aqueous humor. Here is the ciliary body on the outside of which has ciliary epithelium that produces aqueous humor. Now watch how that aqueous humor then flows from the posterior chamber, pupil, anterior chamber and is drained via the Schlem's canal. So the beta-2 receptors on the ciliary epithelium then is stimulated by epinephrine. So when epinephrine binds, what we see is that there is an increase of the production of aqueous humor. Now, a clinical correlate is in the condition of glaucoma, which is due to too much aqueous humor, which causes then too much pressure, and it can get very serious, even resulting in blindness. A treatment is eye drops containing beta blockers. If they drop, put those drops in the eye and the beta blockers block the beta-2 adrenergic receptors, it decreases the production of aqueous humor, thus decreasing pressure. Let's talk about bronchial smooth muscle stimulation causing bronchodilation. Here are the lungs and the bronchi, and here's one airway with the smooth muscle lining that airway, and it has beta-2 adrenergic receptors. So when chromaffin cells release these epinephrine, it then causes bronchodilation. Now, a little anatomy note is that anatomy books often state that direct sympathetic innervation of the airways via nor norepinephrine causes bronchodilation. Norepinephrine actually has very little effect on the airway diameter, which is why circulating epinephrine has a much greater effect. So people who have anaphylactic shock and their airways are constricting, why an EpiPen is what is given because that epinephrine can cause those airways to dilate. On another note, asthma uh, is a condition where the airways can become inflamed, they swell, and you get uh, bronchoconstrictions, they narrow, and you have production of extra mucus makes it very difficult to breathe. It looks like this, normal asthma. So a treatment are these short-acting beta-2 agonists where their airways can get wider and easier to breathe. So here's an inhaler, which then you inhale in these airways, these beta-2 agonists, which then bind to this beta-2 receptor and shing, you get these airway dilation. And so stimulation by these beta-2 agonists can cause bronchodilation to make breathing easier. Now, how do I remember what beta-1 does versus beta-2? This is how I remember it. You have one heart and you have two lungs, beta-1, beta-2. I hope that's helpful. So let's talk about the liver uh, stimulation on these beta-2 receptors on the liver and what it does. So there in the liver and these hepatocytes have these beta-2 adrenergic receptors. So when the chromaffin cells secrete epinephrine, it results in glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. So glycogenolysis, taking glycogen and breaking it down to those glucose molecules or gluconeogenesis, the production of glucose, either of which causes an increase in blood glucose concentration. 
And finally, the detrusor muscle stimulation causing relaxation. So here is the detrusor muscle of the bladder, which has beta-2 adrenergic receptors. And oh, remember that at the neck, the internal urethral sphincter with an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. So when sympathetic nerves release norepinephrine, shing! You get relaxation of the detrusor muscle and contraction of the internal urethral sphincter, both of which help with filling of the bladder. So there are the beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors. So here are all these effector tissues that we've talked about with the autonomics, which some of them have different adrenergic receptors on them. And don't forget that many of them also have cholinergic receptors. And so depending if you stimulate with acetylcholine or epinephrine, norepinephrine, either way, you're going to get some type of an effect that occurs. And that, my friend, is an overview of adrenergic receptors in a nutshell.